So a uh, quick show of hands. Uh, raise your hand if you are saved, resting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. And raise your hand if you believe you are called. You know your calling and you know it definitively. All right. A smaller number. Now, lastly, raise your hand if you are confident that you are supplied or will be supplied to fulfill your calling. That's pretty impressive, guys. Um, so what I want to talk about today is about answering the call in the digital age. Now, I need to be candid in acknowledging that I was not raised a safe man at all. I was raised in an atheist household. Uh, I uh, went to uh, Germantown Friends nearby in Philadelphia, uh, a Quaker school, uh, but had no real faith. Um, I was uh, raised initially to be a farmer. You see the little picture of a boy in wooden shoes, uh, in overalls, uh, with the plan of becoming a family farmer. That wasn't my calling. Uh, I went on to uh, start my career at uh, Procter & Gamble, was there for nine years, uh, four years in Germany, five years in Japan, and then started a company called Global Market Insight, GMI, in 1999, and uh, proceeded to build a pretty significant enterprise. Now, along with building a significant enterprise comes prosperity, carnal physical prosperity. Um, and I had all of that. I, I won the Entrepreneur of the Year Award, uh, but I also had the Maserati in the garage and the private jet waiting for me on the tarmac. But in 2007, I got the wake-up call. The wake-up call was when the Lord chastened me, and the Lord chastens those he loves. Uh, I was released as CEO of the company that I had started seven years before, just a few months after raising $35 million in institutional private equity to scale that business and take it public. Now, that was a setback. It caused me to contemplate many things about why the world works the way that it does. Uh, I was in defiance about whether or not I would be allowed uh, to build another enterprise, but at the same time was moved to go figure out why the world works the way that it does. And I filled two libraries in the search for truth. Uh, I became a diligent scholar of all kinds of belief systems, both of evil and of good, occult, magic, masonry, witchcraft, all of that, but also the good, different theologies, trying to understand the reason why the world works the way that it does, without any bias, without any preconception about why the world works the way that it does. And along the way, I became convinced that the gospel in its simplicity couldn't possibly be sufficient. I became self-righteous. Um, I actually became what you might characterize as a messianic Jew. Uh, matzah eating, uh, 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 Moadim observing, um, uh, ritually minded believer of the Moadim and the mitzvot. I had a lot of Jewish friends, and I still have a lot of Jewish friends as a result, and I don't regret that at all. But the downside of that was uh, not really coming to a clear understanding of the truth, until one day, in, in God's infinite grace, he revealed to me what most of you, I think all of you know, and that his work was sufficient. And in tears, on my knees, I rested in his finished work and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. However, some months later, in contemplating the possibility that an all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent God of the universe, who doesn't miss much, that he might have a better idea what I should do with my life than I would ever possibly conceive. And so I surrendered my body as a living sacrifice, as Romans 12 tells us to do, and said, Lord, do with this body whatever you like. And shortly thereafter, he showed me a verse. In fact, the verses that I'm showing you are not random verses. They're verses that you all know, so I don't read them to you. But they're verses that the Lord showed me each time. And this particular verse really spoke to me. It really became the verse that called me the most, specifically the notion that at the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge 
shall increase. Now, by this time, I had become kind of an internet entrepreneur. I had a, a significant number of businesses, significant number of experiences and projects, and had a large number of people that I knew professionally and personally that allowed me to do things with the internet that for others would be difficult, but for me would be easy. And immediately thereafter, I was invited to become CEO on a turnaround consultancy basis of a small publicly traded company called Digital Town. Now, Digital Town was doing something completely different uh, uh, than whatever I had prior worked on, but I was called by the brand name Digital Town. It spoke to me, the idea that you could make a town digital. They were working on something related to high school sports. I knew nothing about high school sports. However, as a result of that, I was able to come into contact with a lot of very fascinating people, traveled all over the world and spoke at length. There you see me in front of the city hall of San Antonio, uh, addressing a crowd uh, about an initiative. And uh, ultimately, though, that project uh, was not really going to be commercially successful. But what it did do is it gave me a bunch of tools. I make reference of a TED talk there. I'll tell you about that later. But the point is that I had the opportunity to put stones in the bag, so to speak. Now, in August of 2018, I had a call in. It was the first time that I actually felt specifically called. I was called by the Lord, I believe, to be a registrar. Now, what's a registrar? Uh, a registrar is uh, like a GoDaddy that allows you to have a presence on the internet, uh, domain registration, hosting, and related capabilities. And I had been building one on the side as a project all the way back since 2011, but it had been a hobby project. Uh, I was an investor in domain names, and I built a registrar because I felt like GoDaddy wasn't doing a very good job. But in August 2018, I felt an unction, and I never really had an unction before. The unction was the Lord would need a registrar. I said, okay, Lord, maybe the millennial's coming. You're going to need a registrar in the millennial. I'm your guy. Well, six weeks later, I get a news flash from a colleague in, in the industry, and they said, hey, guess what? There's this site called Gab.com, and GoDaddy just deplatformed them. They took them down. And I said, well, what did they do wrong? I said, I, they said, I don't know. Ah, let me look into this. But I knew kind of at that moment being a believer in due process, that it is possible that this particular site might have been a case of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I kind of philosophically object to that, in general. Uh, after all, if the Apostle Paul uh, could have started his life as Saul of Tarsus, it would be inappropriate for us to believe that nothing is capable of, of not being redeemed. And so, as a result, I said, well, let me talk to the CEO of this company, Gab, and let me get a sense of his heart. Is this a guy that actually is up to no good? Or is there possible, uh, possibly a positive agenda at work here? Well, I, I did that. And of course, the consequence of that was to immediately become the target of a lot of vilification. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the Southern Poverty Law Center. I was immediately named to their hate watch. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, there are articles about me and about Epic uh, that are uh, a catalog of a collective wisdom uh, of a manufactured consensus of a highly liberal media that would like to uh, indemn would like to uh, condemn uh, anybody who is basically engaged in a system of supporting what they consider to be wrong speak. However, the good news is that I was also equipped as I often pray for wisdom, knowledge, providence, courage, and faith to engage that battle. And the main forum of our industry, the domain industry, is called Name Pros. Well, as it turns out, that particular forum was used also to try to condemn me and to try to drive me out of the industry as a bad actor. And around uh, that time, uh, this was in March of this year, I decided, after getting some advice from some people that I consider to be clever, to engage the battle. Um, I decided to basically approach the problem from the position of authenticity and transparency. I was like, if you're going to engage me in a dialogue about why I am bad, let me answer all your questions. 
without allowing you to put me in a position where I feel like I have made a, made a mistake. But if I did, let me listen to that mistake and let me adapt in response to that feedback. And so I did that. And so the most uh, popular thread of this forum called NamePros was this particular thread called What's Going On With Epic and Rob Monster? I turned lemons into lemonade. Now, at the same time, uh, the Lord in his infinite wisdom was arranging certain things. Uh, I had an opportunity to do a series of acquisitions. The first one was a company called Bitmitigate. Those of you who are familiar with a technology called Cloudflare, it is designed to keep your internet presence online, so you cannot be taken down through denial of service and other uh, techniques that are used to basically hobble a web presence from being able to be discovered on the internet. And we were able to buy that company on very opportunistic terms. A few months later, uh, in May of this year, uh, I had the opportunity to buy the hosting company that was providing services to Gab. Uh, they were also in a position where they needed somebody to help them and needed greater resource. And they had blind spots around capital formation and uh, governance and, and, and such things. And so I said, well, let me take a look at that as well. And we were able to do that deal in relatively short order. And then lastly, um, also this year, uh, it was around July, um, uh, one of the principles of civil systems approached me and said, you know, Rob, uh, if we want, we could actually be our own internet service provider uh, by essentially getting our own so-called IP address. Uh, we can get our own so-called autonomous system, our own border gateway protocol, all these technologies that essentially allow you to secure sovereignty on the internet. I said, well, how much would that cost? And, you know, can we do it? And he laid it out for me. I said, okay, let's do it. And we did it. It took about four weeks and it was done. Uh, we are essentially are sovereign on the internet. Now, unfortunately, as, as strong as I am and as stubborn as I am at some times, um, I also have to acknowledge that the adversary was hard at work. The adversary went for the soft target. The soft target was the women of my house. Uh, specifically, he went after my wife. Uh, and being a Seattle resident, uh, it's not hard to build a consensus that a particular person doesn't deserve the right to be in their midst. Uh, I was vilified in the Seattle Times and vilified in a variety of other uh, publications and uh, specifically on Facebook. And they targeted my wife's very successful medical clinic. They went from gaining 10 patients a day to losing two patients a day. And uh, no uh, local publication would run their advertising. It was effectively a boycott. Um, and at the same time, uh, there was a lawsuit that was initiated by a former business partner. That business partner had since become a shaman and a witch. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, my wife had a terrible fall and broke her back. Uh, so, you know, it was really like, okay, you know, this is really coming at the soft target. And by the grace of God, uh, she has muddled through and is gaining strength and growing in faith, shorter in stature, stronger and, and taller in spirit. And another woman, besides my wife, who inspires me, is a woman that some of you have maybe come across, uh, now deceased, Corey Ten Boom, and she speaks of this notion of God's perfect logistics. And that's really what I have experienced. Uh, what you will find uh, if you do a deep dive on all the things that we're working on is that we have not shied for a moment from taking on difficult problems that we are uniquely equipped to solve. Um, and we have been able to do it very methodically. And in part, this is possible because we have designed our products around extreme efficiency to be able to provide great value and earn a margin. That margin also supplies a variety of what I call Epic Labs projects that are designed to solve certain problems around empowering digital sovereignty uh, and essentially providing people a framework uh, for being able to participate in digital empowerment. And most recently, this particular effort has resulted in a special project uh, that, uh, that we refer to as Toki, Toki.com, T-O-K-I. And what is this project seeking to do? It is seeking to challenge Google head on. We have built a technology that allows you to do private anonymous search, but it's more than search. What it's allowing you to do is to be able to search and then engage and then transact 
Imagine if any community in the whole world had the ability to be its own Google and effectively allow you to search, engage, and transact within your community and to do it in a way that is effectively unstoppable, that you are sovereign as a community. Now, one of the technologies that makes this possible is the ability to produce servers that are capable of operating with very little power and able to broadcast uh, to a a range using uh, high high performance Wi-Fi, and even have the ability to allow these servers to be powered with solar power. There are places in the world, and some of you have been these, to these places, where there's no power or there's only power for a few hours every day. So how do you create digital empowerment in an environment where there's no power? Uh, that's a problem. And so I feel that the Lord has led me uh, through. Uh, providence and, and, and through circumstance uh, to be in a position to help bring about a, a future state where another billion people come online in the next five years. And this technology uh, is here available at this time. We have the ability to do this. Uh, for a few hundred dollars, we can deploy a fully uh, capable server with four terabytes of data, enough to basically be the library, the forum, the marketplace, the community framework, uh, the bank, all of that uh, within the community. So that even if they don't have an uplink, they don't have any digital presence beyond whatever is possible in that immediate community, they can participate. Uh, this has profound implications. So in short, this has been a very fascinating journey. I've really enjoyed uh, working on this particular project. I will uh, close with a, an invitation. Having been through this experience, having come to the Lord in 2013 and having surrendered to his purpose in 2014, uh, I have seen firsthand the, the, the result of surrender. Uh, the idea that you made a leap of faith when you first believed. And there's a secondary leap of faith when you're called that you will be supplied. And a lot of people don't heed their calling because they feel they haven't been supplied. If you know your call, have confidence that you will be supplied. And seize that opportunity to fulfill your calling. Otherwise, you will have an eternity of regret. So those are my contact details. If you'd like to learn more, uh, you will see also I have a variety of uh, encrypted messenger addresses for reasons that are probably obvious. Uh, feel free to get in touch. There's also a link to the TED Talk, which is officially a banned TED Talk, but you can nevertheless find it. We, gave, we saved a copy. Thank you very much.